Folks on the phone, we're about to get started. Once again, if you want to ask a question, um, text me at 359-7190, and I'll put you in the queue. When you do ask your question, hit star 61 to unmute your phone. And we will be live on Facebook as well. Um, Dr. Newell, why don't you take it away from here? All right, thank you everyone. Uh, Dr. Gail Newell, County Health Officer, and here with Jen Herrera, Chief of Public Health, and Director Mimi Hall um, of Health Services Administration. Health Services Agency Administration. Uh, as usual, I'm going to start with uh, our most recent data from our data dashboard. This can always be accessed at santacruzhealth.org. And um, you'll find that the website has been updated um, and is very interactive now. Um, you'll find a lot of really good, interesting information there about how COVID is uh, in our community. Today, we have a total known case number of 2319 cases of COVID-19 reported to date. Of that total number, 306 are active known cases, and just over 2,000 are recovered. If you've been following our website daily or regularly, you'll notice that today we're reporting a new death. Um, so a total of nine deaths reported at this time. Uh, we wish to extend our condolences to uh, this person's family and friends. She was a Latinx woman in her early 60s with underlying health conditions, but COVID is her primary cause of death. And um, we want to uh, make sure the community is aware of deaths because the risk to our community from COVID remains significant. We've also this week had two additional deaths reported to us verbally. We're waiting for uh, confirmation on death certificate before releasing further information on those. And I'm going to adjust my mask so it doesn't keep slipping down. Sorry. All right. Um, so of our 2,300 cases, 149 have required hospitalization. Um, and if you look at our epidemic curve, um, it had been following a very nice viral trend of moving upwards and downwards. So a kind of steep upward climb. And then over the last two months, really since our big outbreaks in July, uh, it's been steadily moving downward until the last 10 days or so. Uh, we initially thought perhaps we were stable at a, at a certain case rate, but it looks now like we're moving upward. Um, this seems to have been driven by a number of factors um, still under investigation, but uh, it seems to be that there were some cases associated with Labor Day gatherings, Others having to do with fire evacuation, including in at least one identified shelter situation. And others um, in the usual method of, or our most common method of person-to-person -person spread through household situations. And then um, we also now have a very significant and worrisome outbreak in a skilled nursing facility. Uh, Watsonville Post-Acute Skilled Nursing Facility in Watsonville uh, has now reported to us 27 positive cases in residents out of the 73 total and uh, six staff, I believe, to date. Yes, six staff to date. There have been significant staffing shortages and um, the California National Guard has come in to help cover staffing shortages at Watsonville Post-Acute, so we're very grateful to them. Um, we have the potential of having many more COVID-positive residents and staff at that facility, although all precautions are being taken, as they were previously. And um, uh, to clarify, there were no relaxed visitation uh, events or um, uh, policies at Watsonville Post-Acute, um, from everything we've seen, they were doing everything possible to prevent this kind of outbreak and following all of the guidelines. Um, we will probably never know how the outbreak started. Um, both 
staff and residents tested positive initially, so we don't have a case that we can call as patient zero. Um, so, um, but as with all skilled nursing facility outbreaks, it is most likely due to staff because the residents aren't coming and going. Um, it's the staff that are and are more likely to bring COVID into the facility. Not always the case, however, and I said we, we will never know exactly how this one started. Um, so the potential for fatalities in that outbreak is significant and um, we will be working closely with them as we have been from the beginning of the outbreak and for months now already as we have with all of our skilled nursing facilities. As far as where we stand in the governor's tiered uh, economic recovery uh, system, we are still in the red tier, level two, um, which shows widespread uh, disease in our community still, but does allow for some economic uh, leniency. We will be there for at least another two weeks through Tuesday, October 6, um, based on our data that we have at this point. Um, some private schools have opened for classroom education this week, um, as they are allowed to do in the red tier. Um, transitional kindergarten through grade 12 is allowed to open for classroom restrictions with all precautions and regulations followed. And we've been working closely with those private schools that have opened and with our public schools and county office of education to continue to allow them to plan for classroom openings in the future. Um, we want to remind people that um, testing is much more available now. We have plenty of testing capacity in the county and we encourage anyone with any COVID symptoms to contact their primary care provider's office to arrange for testing. Um, and if you have a known uh, exposure to a COVID case, that would also be an indication for testing. Uh, and then some essential workers now need to be tested, such as our teachers and educators and other essential workers, and there is testing availability for those as well. There are state regulations in place that require healthcare providers to uh, supply, provide testing and to pay for the testing as well. And um, so that is widely available. And uh, there's also testing available um, at sites like CVS pharmacies and um, other uh, state and federally uh, funded systems. The Optum Care, Optum Serve site at um, Ramsey Park is still open and available and will be at least through the month of November. Um, there are testing slots available on short notice and turnaround times now are excellent. Um, at uh, less than 48 hours in almost all cases. Uh, we also want to remind folks that um, it's important to get your flu shot this season more than ever. Um, so you've probably heard about uh, uh, the media and others calling this a twindemic of flu and COVID-19, and we don't want that to happen in our own community. So please, please get your flu vaccines. Uh, they're widely available now. Um, we don't want our hospitals to become overwhelmed if we have a big flu season along with COVID. And a reminder that flu vaccines reduce your chances of illness, hospitalization, and death. It's especially important for those with chronic conditions. Most health insurance plans cover the cost of the flu shot and the visit to get the flu shot. Um, you can find out more at tell me again, vaccinefinder.org. Vaccinefinder.org will tell you more about where you can get your flu shot, but we always recommend that it's best to connect with your primary care provider and receive your health care, including your flu shot, um, in that way. For anyone who is uninsured or underinsured, where the plan does not provide a flu shot, you may come to either county clinic at Emmeline campus or Watsonville and get a flu shot at no or low cost. It may cost as much as $15. That's a small price to pay for a flu vaccine. Uh, lastly for me right now is um, Halloween guidance. Um, the state is developing guidance. The governor will be releasing guidance 
hopefully uh, in the next couple of days. So we're holding off on putting out any local guidance because the state guidance will supersede that. And uh, so there will be um, lots of really detailed information. What we do know about that, I've seen um, a draft version of it, is that there will not be any gatherings of any kind allowed. So a reminder that uh, no haunted houses, no big parties, no small parties. Um, we will be messaging on if you're going to trick or treat, how to do that more safely. Um, and so look for guidance both on Halloween and on Dia de los Muertos um, with some uh, messaging about how to do that more safely. Um, it's a great chance for everyone to get creative and make their own uh, fancy face covering COVID mask for Halloween or Dia de los Muertos. And I think that's all the presentation I have. Um, would anyone like to add anything or we'll go right into questions? I think we could go into questions. All right. Yes, sir. Yep. Um, Dr. Newell, as far as the um, skilled nursing facility in Watsonville, a two-parter here. First, when was it first identified as an outbreak or the first, first cases? And then what are the current rules right now when it comes to visitation um, for skilled nursing facilities? So the nursing home had two positive results on their routine testing on Friday. Um, one in a resident and one in staff. They notified the California Department of Public Health, their licensing agency, on Saturday, and they notified us on Sunday. Okay. And, then, and then as far as the current rules for visitation and things like that for skilled nursing facilities, has that changed at all? I did release new health officer orders last week for skilled nursing facility visitation. Um, those don't go into effect in any skilled nursing facility that's had a positive case in the past 14 days. And so this um, uh, skilled nursing facility had not relaxed visitation rules. Uh, we have a phone question from Todd Gal. Todd, uh, can you hit star 61 and unmute your phone? Okay, yeah, thanks for taking my call. Um, I, really quick, I did a story this past week on the four um, people from Watsonville High School. They're all worker, uh, teachers at Watsonville High who died. Um, there's some indication that they may have had COVID. Is there a way that we can confirm that? I, I, know, I know there's HIPAA rules, but um, I'm just hoping that you can in some way confirm that. I have not been involved at all with those cases. Um, as far as I know, our agency, our public health division has not been involved. And um, if there was a concern, we would certainly have been notified by the coroner's office. Um, so I don't have any indication that that's the case. Okay, thank you. Um, my other question is, you mentioned that some private tools are opening. Can, can, you, give, can you say which ones? Is there a, a list or something that are reopening? I received a list of 14 schools who were planning to open this week or next week from the County Office of Education. I don't have that with me, um, and I don't even know if that's a public list. Um, I think that would be a, a good place to ask. We'll do that. Thank you. That's all I have. Uh, do we have any other phone questions? I know there's a few people on the line. Hit star 61 if you want to ask a question. Once. Hi, this is Jenna from Bay City News. Hi. I have a quick question. Um, you said that there were uh, there was the nine COVID deaths, but then there were two additional deaths. Are um, you still waiting to see if they're COVID related? Those were reported by telephone to us, and we were told that they were COVID related, but we always need to wait for the death certificate and also to confirm that they are actually Santa Cruz County residents. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Drew, do you have another question? Yeah. yeah I do. Um, as, as far as schools, Dr. Newell, what will it take now for public schools to be able to open in person to some capacity? I know before the problem was mostly testing. Uh, the County Office of Education has successfully um, contracted with Stanford University Labs to do their surveillance testing, so that is no longer an issue. And um, we have contact tracing capacity to follow the schools as well. Um, 
Personally, I'm happy to see just a few schools opening at this point so we can kind of get our feet wet with um, how we're going to handle that from a public health perspective, making sure we have adequate staff for contact tracing and case investigation, and uh, see what kind of problems might arise in those schools. I know that um, some of the school districts, the public schools, are committed to not opening through the remainder of the calendar year. Um, others are looking uh, to open later in the fall, and several have been impacted by the fires and um, COVID is not, uh, reopening classrooms is not a priority for them at this point. Um, Phil Gomez, you have a question? It's hit star 61 to unmute your phone. Mr. Gomez, are you there? All right, why don't we jump to uh, Michelle Loxton from KAZU. Michelle, if you can hit star 61 to unmute your phone. Thanks, Jason. I just wanted to get uh, a count, the numbers again, from Dr. Newell for the Watson Ball Post-Acute uh, Skilled Nursing Facility. Just to confirm, it's 27 positive cases out of 73 six staff to date. Is that correct? That's correct. And out of the 73, is that, is that residents uh, at the facility or does it include staff? There are 73 residents at, reported to us at the facility. 27 have tested positive. And it's called the Watsonville Post Acute Centre. Correct. Thank you very much. So I'd like to make kind of an overall comment on what we're seeing, and um, I think it's clear what's happening in the nation, what's happening in the state, and we're experiencing it in our own county. Uh, we cannot be complacent as public, and so we are going to be in this continued state of increased cases and then responding with actions, and I know that there's a lot of talk about uh, a national vaccine being available soon. And I want to encourage people that while that will be a positive thing when it is available, it's not going to be the magic bullet. It takes a lot of action on behalf of every single person in our community to do what we've been asking all of these months is to take those precautions that ensure that we're reducing the risk of transmission and exposure, the usual, I'm surprised Dr. Newell didn't say <laughs> wear your face covering, stay six feet apart, be outdoors if you can. We hope to come out really, really soon with a little bit more information about how you can reduce your risk by, um, it's not a choice of either, either or, but um, some safer ways to go about your lives as we try to um, find a place in the many months of this pandemic. I've had a lot of questions lately about uh, the vaccine, and so when there is a vaccine available, it's, there will be production and it won't happen all at once. So we will still be in this continued state of a lot of effort and resources on behalf of all local health jurisdictions on rolling out that vaccination plan, identifying the most at-risk populations that the federal government will likely identify for us to distribute those. And so I just ask everyone, we're in such a concerning place right now. Our, our epidemic curve is going up dramatically. And when you compare our reproductive rate, meaning um, whether we have exponential spread or how exponential our spread is, we're one of the worst performing counties in California right now, right behind Lake and Lassen counties, and that's a concerning trend. So I just ask everybody to be vigilant and be mindful and um, we can't test or trace our way out of a pandemic. Prevention really is the best medicine. All right, let's try one more. Phil Gomez from KSBW. Phil, hit star 61 to unmute your phone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Okay, very good. I, I wanted to get back to the skilled nursing facility. Um, the big concern, I mean, what what is being done? Are there still... Uh, people who are patients or living there and what's being done for them? Are they all been moved? So it's um, 
best not to move people around. Um, the same reason we don't move uh, homeless encampments during this COVID pandemic. Um, the more mixing, the more movement we have within the community, the greater at risk our community is. And so the same is true with skilled nursing facilities, is if we can keep those residents in place, um, that it's safer for everyone, including those residents. Um, you can imagine these are some of the most fragile, medically fragile individuals in our community, and it would be very physically hard on them to move, especially if they are COVID infected. And so we've established a red, yellow, green zone system, which we have practiced with the skilled nursing facilities now for many months. Our nurses have been in the facilities working with the staff and administrators there and um, have determined the best way to create these, these different colored zones that are for um, positive patients who are isolated, are in the red, quarantined patients who have been exposed are yellow, and the non-exposed patients, non-ill patients are in the green zones, and then the staff are assigned similarly, so if they are no, known to be infected, but are still able to work, if they're asymptomatic or not severely ill, then they work with the impacted, infected patients. So um, it's a, a proven method that's been utilized around the world and has proven to be the safest way of working with these skilled nursing facility outbreaks. Dr. do you know if these um, the patients or the people who live there or stay there, um, are they from out of county? Because um, my understanding is these uh, people who are being seen here are not just from Santa Cruz counties, but they're also from Monterey County and other uh, surrounding counties. Uh, I don't know that uh, detail of information, but uh, these are generally people from our own communities with families in our own communities nearby, which is why they're in our our skilled nursing facilities here. Gotcha. And uh, again, I just wanted how many people currently, staffers and uh, residents, um, are being treated for COVID there? Um, that number that we gave you already, the 27 residents and six staff are those that have been reported to us. Okay. Very good. Is there a concern that other skilled facilities in our county, I mean, are they being watched carefully as well? Yes. So anytime there's an outbreak in one skilled nursing facility in the county, all of the seven skilled nursing facilities in our county are notified. And um, some of them share staff. And so that way they're able to uh, make sure that those staff aren't rotating through their facilities. Um, so that is the case. And um, uh, both Watsonville Post Acute Center and their sister facility, which is next door, the Watsonville Guild Nursing Facility, um, Watsonville Nursing Home, I believe it's called, um, both of those are closed to new admissions and will not be discharging patients either. So. Um, we're making sure that movement in those facilities is minimized. Dr. Nell, would you speak to very us? Good. Thank you very much, Dr. Nell. Yes, um, just to make sure that everyone knows, um, the nursing facilities have been on a surveillance testing program for many months already. So every week, 25% of their staff are tested in a surveillance plan. And all of the local nursing facilities have been very compliant with this testing, and we help oversee that. Our nurses from our communicable disease unit are very involved, and our emergency preparedness team as well. And um, so we've been preparing for this kind of event um, and doing everything we can to prevent this type of event as well. Um, if there's a positive in any of that surveillance testing, then um, widespread testing throughout the facility, and the staff is done. Drew? Yeah, for either me or, or Dr. Newell, maybe when you talk about the concerning trend that we're on, is that mostly due to fire evacuation, and as Dr. Newell mentioned, Labor Day, or is there something else? And then kind of on top of that, have we probably seen all the cases that we're going to when it comes to due to evacuations and things like that, or could we still have more coming? So it's, many of our cases that we've had in the last 10 days are still under investigation, but as Dr. Newell mentioned, um, we have seen some cases from Labor Day. 
Um, we only recently began seeing cases associated with the fire. For the first three and a half weeks or so, we hadn't seen any, and we thought, well, with the time frame that has passed, we're probably past that. But as you know, there are still some people that are evacuated or will not have a home to return to. So I think it's a combination of factors um, that are really, really difficult to tell. And as time goes by, I think what we're going to see is um, more of um, more proportionate spread of different kinds of transmission. But the most important thing is to identify cases early because wherever that source of transmission is, it's the household close contact person to person transmission that is still making up the vast proportion of what we're seeing. And then secondly, we're seeing that continued trend of the largest proportion of new infections that we're seeing are in young people. And young people are our essential workers. They um, haven't been staying at home as those of us who are older have been able to in the kinds of jobs that we have. And so all of these things kind of impact uh, what we're seeing in our transmission trends. And I'm very, very concerned going into the fall, uh, having more indoors activities, all of the holidays happening. So this is probably, we're all concerned. We feel like this is the beginning of us really needing to get ready for um, an increase in cases and a lot more response in the coming months. All right. Well, thank you all for attending today. Um, we'll try to do these as needed going forward. Talk to you soon.